Well, it's been two years. I guess let's go ahead and do this again. Hey, what's up, bookworms and fantasy lovers? Mike back again to talk some favorite fantasy series of all time. This is a video I kind of did on the fly two years ago this month. And uh, it's something that people always commonly ask me, hey, you ever going to update that? And the reason I did this is because I said, I don't feel like maybe maybe enough hasn't changed since then. I said, like, you guys don't want me to like do it and like two things change, everything else stays the same. Well, I actually kind of looked at it and I said, okay, I feel like there's been enough changes there. I can do this uh, in good culture. I think every two years, because I'm reading a lot of new series. Some of them are great. Some series are kind of dropping off for different reasons, not necessarily because they're bad or being replaced. But I think just maybe, you know, as, as I've, I've grown as a reader, I guess you'd say. Yes, even in two years, I think you can grow as a reader. And uh, some things have changed. So I think now is as good a time as I need to update this list. So let's just jump right into it. It's going to be 10 favorite fantasy series of all time as of. April 2022. But uh, I do, of course, have a couple of honorable mentions first. And there are going to be some things to have some people flipping some tables right away. But as always, guys, I want you to remember these are just my opinion. Uh, obviously, if I haven't read that series, it's probably not going to be on this list. I mean, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the most common comment on the last video was, where's this series, this one, this one, this one, this one. Well, I mean, if I haven't read it, obviously it can't be my favorite. But uh, yeah, I encourage you to tell me what your favorites are. Instead of telling my my mind suck, but you know, this is the internet. These things happen. So honorable mentions uh, first of all, I go with uh, Ryura, just the universe as a whole, by Michael J. Sullivan. It's a series I really love. Ryura Revelations haven't gotten to Chronicles yet, and I'm about halfway through Legends of the First Empire. I've been kind of lukewarm on that one, whereas I love Ryura Revelations, so I think that's enough for it to keep it out of the top ten. But it's definitely something I feel like is going to keep growing. I think that that, that universe that he's building is just massive, and it's just going to keep getting better and better. And uh, I, just just some writing choices that he's made in the prequel series I'm kind of like, uh, on. Whereas Ryo Revelations, I think maybe I just miss Royce and Hadrian a lot, but maybe one of the best duos ever in fantasy. And those are tough shoes to fill, you know, when you're going, you know, thousands of years in the past. So th I think that might be a reason why, but uh, it's still, it's one of those I could see being on this list, you know, who knows by 2025 or something like that. Who knows? We shall see. The other one I got to kind of talk about, this is going to be the first mover from the last list that's fell out of the top 10 is on the honorable mentions here. This is the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Now this isn't because I've felt like uh, it just doesn't really deserve it anymore. I kind of started looking at it and being like, how much of this can you really base just off nostalgia, Mike? I mean, there's some things you got to look at and be like, you love this because you read it when you were a kid, and I did. I read Narnia when I was a kid. It's always going to be beloved to me. But it's like, it's one of those things when you get a little older, can you really look at it the same way you did as a kid? Now, when I read uh, Narnia now, I go back and I think it's charming as can be, but it's nowhere near what I would call my top 10 at this point. So it's a series that's always going to be dear to me. I think it's a very, very monumentally important series, especially for young readers to get into. But I really don't think I can call it a top 10 for me at this point in life anymore. But uh, yeah, it, it spent a long time on this list up here. So no regrets there. It's a, it's a series I think is just fantastic. And if you've got a young reader, please let them cut their teeth on that in The Hobbit because I think that's be the best place for them to start. And then probably the one I said will probably have people flipping tables. Honorable mentioning uh, Malazan. Now, the reason that this is on an honorable mention and not in the top 10 is I think it will be in the top 10 one day. I need to complete it first. I've got three books left. Uh, I have enjoyed five of the seven that I've read immensely and immensely enjoyed them. The other two, it's kind of hit or miss. You can watch all those reviews on the channel if you want to know what I mean. But uh, it's one of those things where I can't in good conscience put it on this top 10 here when I haven't finished it because these last three books could be completely unsatisfying to me. And then am I going to be like, ah, well, no, that's not really a top 10 fan series. So I think it's definitely off of its ambition uh, alone of what Mr. Erickson has done. I think it definitely should go there in the top 10. But again, uh, I think that was just kind of like a, a to be determined there. I'm going to give it an incomplete because I have yet to finish it. But I still hope to sometime this year. Okay, guys, let's move into the list proper here. This is number 10. And it's going to seem kind of recent, but I really couldn't find a reason to keep it off of here. And this is Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn by Tad Williams. This is a series that I have put off reading for 20 plus years, uh, much to the behest of my brother's urging. Uh, you know, I, I just kept putting it off, kept finding a reason to not do it. And I'm glad that I finally did it because I thought it was absolutely wonderful. It was a very, very slow journey. There is a very slow burn to the series. 
but it's one I think has a very satisfying conclusion. So uh, it's one of those things where, do I think it should have been shorter? Not necessarily. That's just Ted Williams' writing style, I think. So if you don't need, you know, the action, nonstop action every page, and you like to just do some character studying and some world building, I think it'll be a series that you like quite a bit. I think fans of Robin Hobb will really, really love this series because when I was reading, I got a lot of Farseer vibes out of the beginning of it. So uh, just your typical traditional fantasy. It's one I think is very important because it felt like the bridge between like 80s traditional fantasy and to kind of what we got to with like A Song of Ice and Fire. It felt like that bridge between it where, you know, our characters weren't necessarily safe. He was killing off important characters. There was a lot of grim stuff being happening, uh, being involved with our characters, a lot of bad things happening to them. So I think it's very important for that reason alone, and it definitely deserves a place here in my top 10. And I think that I will definitely be reading more Tad Williams in the future. I know I'll be reading more Ocenar, but I'm also going to uh, take a break from that, and I'm going to read Otherland next. But yes, Tad Williams, uh, three for three for me at this point. And, uh, you know, I, mean, I guess if you want to call book three th one book, I mean, it's just, it's just monstrous. But a uh, great series. But as long as you understand, it is a little slower paced but it has a great payoff. And one of the most satisfying conclusions to a fantasy series I've read in a long, long time. Number nine. Now, this might be the point where if I look at the analytics of this video after I post it, where everybody clicks off because this is the biggest mover from my 2020 list. And it's going to surprise some people here. And this is The Cosmere by Brandon Sanderson. Yes, this dropped like five spots from before. And I think the reason why, guys, because I still think any of these series in the top 10 are an all-timer for me. I've read a ton of fantasy series. So I don't think anything should be ashamed for being in this list. But with me, at the time, I hadn't read everything by Brandon Sanderson. Since then, I've read Elantris. I've read Mistborn Era 2. Uh, I've read Warbreaker. I've read just everything in the Cosmere outside of just Stormlight Archive. I've only read Mistborn Era 1 and Stormlight Archive the last time I did this. So that's why I kind of moved down because Mistborn Era 2 didn't really work for me. Elantris big miss for me. So it's one of those things where I still think he's an absolutely incredible writer and uh, the series does deserve its spot here in the top 10. But I, it's one of those, it's like, it kind of went down a little bit for me because I, especially I didn't even really care for the, the fourth Stormlight book. That even brought that down a little bit. And that's one of my favorite fantasy series going right now is Stormlight Archive. So it was just one of those things I think I've kind of looked at and just said, maybe it, he, it's not quite as infallible as I thought it was, you know? So, uh, but again, guys, you got to understand that this, in my top 10, this is this is quite, quite big uh, to still be in this here. And I, I definitely think it's within this. And it's, Stormlight 5 could come out. And you know what? When I do this series again, uh, it'll be back up in the top five, I'm sure. So it's just one of those things where I, I, I read everything by him and felt like, okay, I, I feel like I'm almost, you know, batting like about 600 with him, which is still great. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think Mistborn Era 2 and Elantris really, really brought the average down for me. But again, like I said, in the top 10, uh, I, I don't feel really bad about it, but I know a lot of uh, Sandersonites or whatever whatever they're called, Sandersonians, Sandersonians maybe, uh, I, I feel like they're going to be very, very upset about that. But again, uh, like I said, I don't consider anything on this list anything short of incredible. And that's why at number eight, guys, I have the Dresden Files. I'm completely current on this now. I had it kind of like... Uh, I think I had it like in the bottom half of my top 10. Might have been in the same spot. I don't know. I should have watched that again before I did this. But I hadn't finished it yet. And obviously, I guess I can't finish it because he's not, Mr. Butcher's not done with it yet. But I am current with the series. And it's a series that people will tell you when you first start, oh, it just gets better and better. And you think that's just a line, right? Well, it turns out it's true. Somehow, he has found a way to make his series just get better and better as it goes along. And it's really amazing because, you know, usually they start to degrade a little bit. They start to feel a little formulaic. And there are some that will kind of fall into that, hey, I know what's going to happen next with these, but I still think that each one has its own identity and it makes it more than just your monster of the week because he does have continuing storylines that just keep going. And you realize that you've been through almost 20 years of this character's life at this point and you're still anxious to find out what happens next. That's amazing. That's amazing that Mr. Butcher's been able to do this. So Harry Dresden, uh, definitely an all-time character. My only fantasy, uh, urban fantasy series I've ever read, if you don't count Hellblazer or, uh, or you know, a lot of people don't count comics, you know, so I, I don't really ever want to say that, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer books. Uh, I don't know what classifies as, you know, urban fantasy has such a, so you know, a lot of people will be like, yeah, that is. And then the next person will be like, no, that is not urban fantasy. I, I don't know. But that, that, that's the only one I have on the list, I think, that is without a doubt called urban fantasy. And it deserves its place here in the top 10. I think if you haven't read it yet, you're really, really missing out. And you should definitely check it out because it does just get better and better. And guys, you can read through those so quick. I caught up uh, before Peace Talks in 
like eight months time while I was reading Wheel of Time at the same time. So there we go, guys. How about number seven, a new entrant on this list from the last time I did this. This is going to be The Banished Lands by John Gwynn. This is a Faithful and the Fallen. This is of Blood and Bone. Seven books, and I think all seven of them are damn near flawless. This guy kind of came out of nowhere for me. It was one of those things where sometimes you just get this idea that, say there's this band that is really popular and you never really listen to it, but you just know that they're going to click for you. That's kind of how it was with me and John Gwynn. I had never read a word, but for some reason, I just had this gut feeling he was going to be an author I love. So I bought all seven of these books before I read a single one. And I was right because it's a series that I just, I flew through and I could not get enough of. And while I'm at the point now where I'm like, hey, I'm too old to reread a lot of these fan series, I know I'll reread Faithful and the Fallen one day because I really do love that series. Now, I like Faithful and the Fallen a bit more than A Blood and Bone because it is, yeah, I, just, I love that crew a little more, but A Blood and Bone was phenomenal. It really, really was. So I think that this is an author that everyone is kind of learning about in the fantasy community. Uh, they, the, um, Bloodsworn Saga right now is really getting a lot of new eyes on his content. But uh, yeah, Faith on the Fallen is just, that's right up there. Just like as soon as I, I was reading it, I just knew I was reading uh, an instant classic for me. This was something I was going to revisit a lot. And I definitely think, you know, it's been two years now since I read it. I definitely think that, uh, I, yeah, I'm really missing Corbin and the gang. I got to get back to it someday. So uh, I think if there's any series out there that is prime to be turned into a series on HBO or Netflix or something like that, this is it. I think this would be phenomenal television. So, uh, yeah, pick up these if you haven't yet, guys. This is when I only, I, the arrow is pointing up. I can see this one being higher on the list as time goes by because I'm only liking it more and more. Now, the rest of them here, I feel like you may have heard them before. They might be in a little bit of a order, different order. So some have stayed in the same place. Some have moved a little bit here. So I don't want to you know, give away the tension or anything. But let's move on to number six. Uh, number six for me is going to be The Wheel of Time. Now, I can't remember if that's the same place or not, but I remember people were upset where I had it last time. With me, I said that Legacy takes time. I had just finished Wheel of Time, like literally a week before I made that list last time. Uh, I feel like the arrow is definitely still pointing up. Uh, when the show came out and recounting the books, I really did remember just how much I really did love my journey on The Wheel of Time. Uh, sure, warts and all, I do really love it. I could see why people read the series again and again and again. And if I had read it when I was younger, sure, I'd be more willing to commit to reading it again. Like I said, this age, I feel like I'll never be able to read everything I want before I uh, you know, move on to the Grey Havens. But uh, right now, I'm like, yeah, I don't got time for another 14 book series. Uh, so I don't know if I'd ever reread it, but I could definitely see why people would want to because even at the very beginning, Robert Jordan is really planting those seeds for everything that's going to happen in that series. And I think on a reread, it would just be absolutely amazing. If you think back at the Eye of the World, there is stuff that he foreshadows in that first book that come around to play at the end of the series. Just absolutely amazing, amazing plotting by this guy. And uh, yeah, he's a beautiful, beautiful writer. So is the series a, a little longer than the two? Sometimes it can feel that way. But I think it's one of those where the journey is definitely worth it. Anytime you got a 14-book series, you're going to have some that might not be as good as others. But I definitely don't think that takes away from it. But I also think that's the reason why I can't put it uh, in my top five yet. But that's, again, like I said, another one where I feel like the legend of it only grows as time goes by. So I can see that definitely moving up sometime in the future. Now, number five, this is probably my least favorite, uh, least uh, popular pick on this list. But I will never discount what Harry Potter has meant uh, to, to my life. To sharing it with my kids now is really just something that... Uh, just goes to show that this is a story that is just knows nothing about. It's not bound to any one generation, any gender, any religious ideals, anything. It is for everyone. It doesn't matter about what age you are. It doesn't matter about what kind of books you like. Harry Potter was for everyone, and it still feels that way because my kids seamlessly just would have instantly just hooked on this. And reading it to my kids, again, just made me remember how much I love this. And the reason that I, I said last time, and I got to kind of echo it again here, is I don't think that we will ever see a movement like we saw for Harry Potter ever again. I don't think we'll ever see people standing in line at bookstores at midnight, at Walmart at midnight, just waiting for a book release like we did with Deathly Hallows. We will never see that again. And I, I, I feel very comfortable saying that. I know a lot of people, when I say that, people are like, oh, I bet you when the Doors of Stone or Winds of Winter comes out. I don't think so. I, you will never see that because 
it didn't cross into the mainstream like Harry Potter did. So I don't think you'll ever see the mania like you see for Harry Potter still to this day. So uh, yeah, it's something that I, I'm going to always love. I'm always going to appreciate what it meant, how it got people that weren't interested in reading at all into reading. That is the most important thing. To me, it's always about, I don't care what you're reading as long as you're reading. And Harry Potter got a bunch of people who weren't reading anymore or at all to pick up a book and read. That's why it'll always be special to me. And of course, the story ain't half bad either. It's a story that I, sure, you can look at it, you know, as a smug, big time fantasy snob and be like, yeah, I can pick holes all through this thing. But you know what? It's still fun. It's still charming. And you still love all those characters. And I think that that is a testament to its greatness. So I will always champion that series. Just like I will number four, guys, it actually moved up a spot from last time. And this is Stephen King's The Dark Tower. I am doing my Dark Tower reread right now, and I am loving every minute of it. This is a series that I think is just so amazing because there's not another one like it at all. I can't think of a scene. Sure, he's got like hat tips of the, like Tolkien and things like that, things that you know obviously inspired him. But never once are you reading Lord of the. I'm sorry, are you reading the Dark Tower and being like, hey, this reminds me of this one series. There is nothing else like it. It is such a unique trip. And what he did, being able to tie his entire universe of books together and making the Dark Tower its connective tissue is just nothing short of just stunning what he was able to do with this series. Yeah, I have my problems with the latter half of the series, and I'm going to be interested to see how I feel about it when I revisit those now at this age. So um, that's why I don't think it would ever be my favorite of all time, but it's up there. It's in the conversation. It is hanging out on that same path of the beam as these other ones on this list. So Dark Tower is a story that will always stay with me. You know, I read it for the first time when I was 19, which I don't think was a coincidence, by the way. And it was just something that has always just stayed right here. I've always had it close to the heart because I just related to those characters so much. I loved that group. I loved that journey. And I think when you go about a story as is just about the journey, I think this is right there with Lord of the Rings and just like you feel like you went to hell and back with those characters. And there's no one better at character than Stephen King. And it goes to show with Roland and company. So uh, I, we are working through that. I'm going to be finishing my reread of that here in the next few months. And I'm very excited to uh, continue to talk about that along the way. Because it's a story that I think is only going to get better with time. So number three, guys. And even though it is incomplete, that does not matter. This is still one of the greatest fantasy series of all time. This is George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of excited for this universe again because House of the Dragons coming out on HBO. And I remember when I read Fire and Blood, the book that that series is loosely based off of. When I read it when it came out, I was jaded. I was mad still that there weren't, that Winds of Winter wasn't out. And I, I think that ruined my enjoyment of it. So I'm going to reread it before that series starts. And I think I'm going to have a great time with it this time because I remember it being, it was good. I was just, I was just mad it wasn't the book that I wanted from George. But this series as a whole, guys, is just a phenomenal read. And the thing is, like the first three books, I would put on par with any other fantasy series out there. And I think that the stuff that George does on the side, his history books, his encyclopedias, things like that, just building the history of this world is right there with Tolkien, in, in right there with Middle Earth, with just building up the history and the lore of this universe. It's just so deep and so compelling. And it's just like every single little tidbit that you get about this world outside of the main five books is, wow, I'd like to see a whole story about that because it's just so compelling. And with the main story, obviously, I think at this point you probably know because I don't think there's very many people who didn't at least watch the show, right? But with the, the books, is I, I think that what George was able to do was he was able to make every moment feel like the stakes were just humongous. It could be something as simple as a dinner party and the tension would be ramped to 11 because you'd feel like at the end of this dinner, things could be changed so much that the entire land is going to be different. And he was able to do that with every damn page. Everything was always such high stakes. And you were just holding your breath the whole time you're reading it. And these are long books. You can't hold your breath that long. It's not good for you. But uh, yeah, the tension is just incredible in those books. The twists, the turns, the characters. Uh, you know, I always tell people <laughs> when they were first getting into the books, you know, don't get attached to anybody. Uh, yeah, I, I think he really set the bar for that for now. Now you get these series where everybody thinks they've got to kill like 500 characters and they say, hey, it's because George R. R. Martin did it, right? 
But it isn't just because of that, guys. I think he always made those matter because he's so good at character work. He made you care about those characters before he took them away from you. And that's why those deaths were lasting and meaningful. But yeah, yeah, sure. I could sit here and tell you I, I wish it was complete too. Who doesn't, you know? And I think it would be in contention for number one if the story was complete because it's just that good. And it's one of those I say, look, the story's incomplete, but in spite of that, it's still a top three fantasy series all time for me. So that tells you how special that story really, really was. And I don't think that that story would have connected when it was very faithfully adapted those first five or six seasons. That's why it connected with so many people who weren't even into fantasy because the story is incredible and it's because that source material is absolutely incredible so that's another one like i said with like with harry potter i will fight to the death that people want to act like it's not important anymore because he hasn't finished it i disagree this is an absolutely important series and it's the reason that a lot of writers that we have now got interested in writing fantasy books so i think that we uh we should all bend the knee to mr george on that and put some respect on his name even if we're frustrated with him about wins a winner i definitely think that he deserves our respect for sure Number two, guys, not a change here. The First Law by Joe Abercrombie. And this is one that uh, just keeps building because uh, since I made that last video, he's completed another trilogy in that series with the, uh, the Age of Madness. But it all starts with me with that first series in that to me, when I read this, this felt like this felt like a song of ice and fire, but without the dragons and without the prophecy kind of stuff. It was just very much straightforward, in your face. It felt as cruel and punishing as Westeros did. The politics were just as good, just as backstabby. And he created some of the most memorable characters of all time in Logan, Jazal, and of course, Glockta. Probably my most intriguing fantasy character of all time. I, I, I can't think of any other series where he can write such despicable characters and you find yourself rooting for them like you want them to win so i i think it's the first series that i read where i was like wow i am rooting for the bad guys to win because it really feels like that sometimes and you start looking at it and you're like well you know there are no good guys no bad guys you know and that that was something new to me at the time it's really cool i think that song of ice and fire did that pretty well making everything morally gray and this really just perfected that and that's why it clicks so well with me and it has just like an all-timer of an ending at the uh, the first trilogy is just a complete just yeah big time and uh, it's something that uh even when i ever revisited it a couple years back when i first started this channel it was something i found that uh, was just as wonderful it was the first time that i read it and uh you know this universe just continues to grow now he's going to go do this other series and i think it's called devils but uh you know he, he's going to come back to this if you read the age of madness and you see how it ended there's no way he's ending it there there's no way he's going to come back to this universe and i will be there waiting because it is just greatness and i can't get enough on it but i mean if, if you guys are fans of the channel you've been here for a while you know that this series is obviously very, very important to me. It's a big reason why I started this channel. Because when I started the channel, it was an accident. I was doing this Wheel of Time stuff, and I said, hey, is this just because of Wheel of Time, or is this something I can do? And then I started talking about First Law, and got so many new people to read it and talk to about it. And I felt like, okay, well, now people know how important this series is to me, because that was the first one outside of Wheel of Time that I covered on the channel. And um, I would love to do more First Law content on the channel. So uh, since we ain't getting any new books by him uh, in that universe for a while, I, I think I might actually go back and revisit those. Who knows? We will see what happens. And guys, I think by now you've done the math. You know what's number one. Yes, the top three did not change in this. Number one, this is The Hobbit. This is The Lord of the Rings. This is Middle Earth, guys. And I don't think that this can ever change for me. I had someone ask me in a live stream, do you think anything ever has a chance of knocking Tolkien out of your top spot on this list. And I, I don't see how. Not this point in life. Because while you might go back and look at it and say, hey, well, you said with Chronicles of Narnia was a nostalgia thing. Here's the difference, though. This doesn't just feel like something I liked when I was young. You know, this feels still feels amazing, still feels epic, still feels grand. I go back and read it now, and I'm still floored by how incredible it is, even at this age, and even if this, you know, just this much well-worn around other fantasy series now, I still find something special about this series. And I mean, this is before you're even talking about how influential it was, how much it meant to everyone else around. All those fantasy authors that we love today, they cut their teeth on The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, you know? But when I mean, you talk about world building, and you're talking about that outside of just those main four books. What he was able to do to completely create a universe was just 
unheard of at the time. And obviously a lot of that work got completed posthumously, but you know, unlike uh, Brian Herbert, uh, Christopher Tolkien actually cared about his dad's material. So it, that's why I think that it actually has just persevered over time. And of course, when the movies came out, it brought up a whole new generation of fans for the story. But for me, guys, it's, it'll always be like just the very essence of the journey. You know, it's eternal for that reason. The journey, this is it. This is the journey to end all journeys. It's a tale of friendship, tale of self-discovery. And these are themes that I will just always be connected to. It'll always be special to me. Sure, The Hobbit, there might be a little bit of a nostalgia there since that was my first fantasy book. But guys, I, I read, I've read Lord of the Rings seven times now. And I love it more and more every single time. So I definitely don't think it's an age thing. Besides Dune, that is the series that I have read the most times in my life. And uh, I could read it tomorrow and be happy because it's still just that good. I mean, there's parts where I can just put the book down and I could probably recite that paragraph for you. Doesn't matter. It's just that good. It doesn't matter that I know what's coming. Because I've heard some people say, oh, I to reread, you know, all the stakes are gone doesn't matter with this story because it's just that magical. It's a magical journey. And uh, you know what? Sometimes we need a little magic. That's why we love fantasy, right, guys? But guys, that was my updated list for uh, my top 10 uh, fantasy series of all time. Now, I've had people ask me, hey, why don't you do one for sci-fi? I don't think I've read enough sci-fi series to do that. You know, I haven't read nearly as much science fiction as I have fantasy. That's why I'm trying to kind of amp up some science fiction because I think right now I uh, maybe could do 10 series science fiction, science fiction series that I've read. <laughs> you know, so that's why I, keep, I did another one for fantasy. But again, this was something that people kept asking me for. They kept asking me to update this. So I uh, hope you're not too upset or disappointed with it. But, uh, you know, I, I, again, I would appreciate it if you just drop in the comments and let me know what you guys' 10 favorite fantasy series are because I would love to talk to you about them. And hey, you want to go ahead and recommend some to me that I don't have on this list? I might not have read them. Let me know down below, guys, and I will talk to you there.